Hi class, this is my week four assignment um, covering chapter 9, 10, and then some uh, Bible study questions. Um, for my first question, I decided to uh, tackle the question of when do the events of the book occur, talking about Deuteronomy, how do the book's legal materials differ from the laws of Exodus and Numbers, and what is the basis of Moses' authority? Um, so we can uh, infer that Deuteronomy begins shortly after the events of Numbers, um, just based off readings and location of where um, the book starts off. Um, and it says, on the plains of Moab by the Jordan across from Jericho in Numbers 36, uh, 13. Um, this is telling us that this was right before the people were about to enter the Promised Land. Moses led them into Moab. Um, they were looking at it. They were watching it. They were seeing it. We all know that Moses is unable to go into the Promised Land. Um, so then he stops his people and he decides to give um, these three speeches to his people um, before they enter the Promised Land, before the, he sets them free into this land. Um, this would be placing the events of Deuteronomy happening around 1530 B.C. to 1410 B.C. Continuing on, um, in both Exodus and Numbers, we find the establishment of the first covenants and laws. This was the original kind of copies of these laws and covenants um, that God gave his people. Uh, Deuteronomy is speaking um, on the same covenants and the same laws, but in a new light, in a new setting. Like I said before, this is right before um, Moses was about to set his people free into the promised land. Um, so he's kind of going back, reestablishing what these laws said and what they meant to the people. Um, and I, I picked up on a little foreshadowing of Jesus coming and establishing the new law. Like we know in the New Testament, Jesus comes down and um, creates this new law for us to follow. Um, and, we kinda, and we see Moses kind of doing the same thing for his people. Um, he is, again, speaking to them before they're entering this new stage of life into this new kind of beginning um, and reestablishing these laws, kind of setting a new standard for these laws. And um, just how Jesus kind of set the new standard uh, for the law for us. Um, continuing on on this question, uh, talking about Moses' authority. Um, we see Moses' authority coming directly from God. Deuteronomy 1.3 says, Moses spoke to the people of Israel according to all that the Lord had given him in commandment to them. See, when we uh, read these stories about Moses, we often see Moses and God directly speaking. Um, God put Moses in charge of this operation, really, to lead these people into this new promised land. Um, so that's where Moses is really getting his authority. The people know that uh, they know the people know who Moses is. They know um, his connection with God and and how they talk and how he, God is leading them through this journey through Moses. Um, so I think that's where where Moses gets a lot of his authority. And I, I just imagine being an Israelite following Moses, I would have full confidence in Moses to to deliver me to this land because I know that he's speaking with God directly. Um, so I, I would I would assume that he is an authority figure. I I, I trust his judgment and his uh, decision making because I know um, the source of that judgment and decision making. Moving on to the next question, um, talking in his speech, uh, what does Moses illustrate in the survey of Israel's recent past? Like I mentioned, uh, Moses right before he let his people into the Promised Land, he gave them he gave them three speeches. Um, this is touching on the first speech that Moses gave. Um, Moses begins his speech with God's command to leave Mount Sinai, highlighting the victories and failures of the Israelites. I think this is really interesting and it's really crucial um, for the Israelites to hear this again, uh, just to be reminded of who they are. Um, he highlighted the Great Rebellion at Kadem Barina, I, I think I'm saying that right, and the negative effects it had, and he highlighted the success of the Israelites in the desert. Um, Again, this is reminding the Israelites of the past successes and the past failures that they have, um, and almost kind of humbling them, I think. Um, without these reminders, I think we can see a trend of the Israelites thinking that they can do uh, things without God, they can do things by themselves, uh, much like how we think we can do things by ourselves in our lives sometimes without God. Um, but at the end of the day, we know that we need God. Um, Moses' reasoning behind uh, highlighting both of these things, uh, it was to prepare Israel, Israel uh, for, the, for the future with God. Um, knowing that he couldn't go into the promised land, I could imagine that Moses 
uh, was kind of looking at this last opportunity to talk to his people um, and kind of set them up. I see I see Moses as almost a father figure in this in this light. I think that um, there are times in in a, hum in a person's life where um, they have to be kind of reminded of what they have done, of what they have succeeded at, and what they have failed at, um, just to kind of remember how they got to the point where they're at today. Um, and I think this is very similar to what Moses is doing right now with the Israelites. Um, he, Moses realized how important his relation or the relationship uh, with God, how important uh, the Israelites' relationship with God was. Um, so he wanted to set them off on the right foot. He wanted to remind them and say, hey, this is where you guys have been. This is what has happened. These are your failures. These are your successes. Look at both of those and have them drive you. Look at your successes and say, this is what it was like when we, we were doing well. We had a really solid relationship with God. We were following his advice. Look at these failures and remind yourself how, what were we doing here that, uh, that caused us uh, astray from God, that led us off the path that God had created, that, that we blatantly disobeyed God, and then look at those consequences that happened uh, as a result, result of that failure. Next question I want to tackle is, how does Deuteronomy serve as a bridge between the Pentateuch and the historical books? Um, Deuteronomy gives us a look back on the past and f uh, Look, look back on the past and forward into the future. Um, this book is a really um, great book kind of to end on here um, because we, <coughs> excuse me, we get a, uh, we get a summary of what has happened in the Pentateuch and it, and it wraps really the entirety of that section up in the Bible. It kind of, it kind of brings this first section of the Bible, this first section of the Old Testament to a close um, with all the information that is in it, with Moses' speeches, um, looking back at what has happened, and again, looking forward into the future, like I said earlier. And it really sets a solid foundation for the books to come. Um, something that I love about the Bible and, and I always try to point out when I see is... Um, the Bible, either in the New Testament or in some of the books in the Old Testament, are referring back to the Pentateuch, referring back to the starting moments um, of the Israelites and, and using language that would be familiar for their times. I know Paul does this a lot in his works. He, he uses this language that uh, people would be familiar with because they, they've studied and read the Pentateuch and, and they know what is happening in there. So Paul uses that um, in a lot of his writings and we, can, and we can reference that directly back to the Pentateuch, which I think is beautiful because it just shows how holistic the Bible really is and how it just works together consistently and uh, all the time. Uh, next question is, what is the theological value of, of, of the historical books? Um, this is a big uh, passion of mine. I, I have started to fall in love with the Old Testament, one, because I took an Old Testament class before this one um, and really saw the importance of the books in the Old Testament, and two, now taking this class, diving a little deeper into some of the topics of the Old Testament, and again, really really showing how important some of these things are. Um but the historical books, like the title suggests, they provide a history of the Israelites. We can read these books and we can get a sense of what was going on in the Israelites' day and how, um, how they lived life and what did, a, what did an actual day in the Israelite look like and just these, uh, these crucial moments of history we find in the Bible. And um, like I said, these books can be really easy to pass over because when you read them, it is like kind of reading like a history book. And I remember reading history books in high school and just being bored out of my mind. Um, but I think that when we look at the history of the Israelites um, and we look at the society that the Israelites were in and, and how they worked as a society, how their relationship with God looked as a society, we can take a lot of those things and apply them to our lives today in 2020. Um there are a lot of lessons to be learned, and there are a lot of things that um, that um, show us how. You're kidding me. Oh, there we go. Sorry, uh, I had a malfunction. Um, but there are a lot of lessons and a lot of a lot of things in uh, the Israelite journey that we can look at and we can learn from. Um, even though it happened so many years ago and we're living in such a uh, technology-driven world, we can look at those things and, uh, and really learn from them. Um, continuing on with this question, kind of looking at this question through the lens of, of a church, uh, these books provide the church with information on, and this is from 2 Timothy 3, 16, uh, on teaching, rebuking, 
correcting and training in righteousness. Um, I think the modern day church, uh, modern day mega church, um, really tries to stay away from these uh, books because, like I said, they are like reading a textbook. You are literally reading the history of the Israelites, and um, you are. It can be boring, and and if you don't have a good teacher, or if um, the the teacher that's speaking kind of misses something or doesn't connect a dot, it can really be confusing. Um, but there are so much, there's so much uh, just wealth in these books. There's so many things that we can take as a church. Um, again, looking at the society of the Israelites and and reflecting it straight back onto the church today and how our, how our uh, relationship with God should look like as a society, as an individual, as a church, what our relationship with God should look like also and how, how we should look, how we should listen to God. Um, and again, these, I think something really cool that we can take from the historical books that we can sometimes just skim over really quick is they kind of provide an insight into God's characteristics and how he loves his people. And I think this is true for the whole uh, Old Testament, the whole Pentateuch. Throughout all of this, we see God's interaction with his people. Um, and like I said, in, uh, I think it was two weeks ago in one of our assignments, we are still God's people. Nothing has changed. We, we God is still interacting with us day by day. Um, and whenever we read the Old Testament, and whenever we read the Pentateuch, we can we can look at those stories and see those stories of God interacting with people, and still apply those to our lives today. Um, I think a lot of times it's really easy, and I do this even, to read a story in the Old Testament and um, think to myself, "This was set back so long ago. There's no way that this can still apply to me today." Now there are a lot of things. Uh, that were happening a really long time ago and that don't happen today. Uh, but God has stayed the same through all of that. God has loved his people unconditionally through all of the time changes, through whatever has happened. He's loved his people. Um, that still uh, applies to us today. Um, how, did the how did the Israelites view the concept of history? Um, this is a really interesting question to me because it was something I never really thought about Um and it's something that I think we can sometimes really take for granted. Um, I say, thankfully, we had the Israelites because unlike their neighbors, they cared about history. Um, the, Israelites, like, the Israelites wrote things down. They, they uh, had these accounts uh, and they wrote them down. Um, a large portion of Israel's ancient writings were historical narratives. They were these stories telling, telling us about what is going on, what is happening, um, and just giving us, like like I said, history, um, so that we know today what had happened back then. Um, and these historical narratives help support the narratives we find in Scripture. We can we can look at these stories that we find in Scripture and and point them back to uh, historical narratives that we found from the Israelites, and and with that kind of provide some some backbone to these stories that we find in Scripture and some truth that that we uh, of these stories that we find in Scripture. Um, and they really kind of help connect all of these dots. They, they have um, kind of all sides covered. Almost you have a the, the, theological side of the of the story, but then you also have the historical side of the story. And I go into that a little bit more in one of our future questions. Um, this one actually, how are the historical facts important to the theology of historical books? Um, the Israelites, uh, very close neighbor. Uh, to the Near East, um, a lot of their religious expressions were supported by myths. Um, whenever I hear myths, I don't know why, but the first thing I think about myth, uh, I think about MythBusters, uh, where they take all of these myths and they test them um, to see whether they're true or not. And and a lot of the things, and I also think about uh, mythology and these stories of Zeus and Poseidon. And I used to read Percy Jackson uh, in high school to, you know, it was a series about a boy who's interacting. He's basically a demigod. Um, but all of these things, to be said, are just myths. They're things that have yet to be proven. They, they don't really have a backbone to them. Um, but because the Israelites uh, wrote things down and they have these historical narratives, uh, they really do support uh, the religion that the Israelites were following. Um, I love what our book had to say about this. The factuality of this, those historical events make it possible to accept the theological assertions of the Bible as true. Um, like I said, the 
fact that we have both the historical narratives um, and the theological narratives uh, working hand in hand, working side by side, uh, supporting each other really uh, kind of creates this backbone of religion that, that myths just don't have. Um, myths don't really have scripture. They don't have historical narratives. Um, they don't, they can't, you can't point back to the days of Zeus and the days of Poseidon, but you can point back to the days of the Israelites, um, which I think is something that is so cool that we have today. Um, especially for me personally, um, I'm a very scientific minded person. I love facts. I love things that can be proven 100% true. Um, going into my next question, I'll talk on this a little bit more. Um, same question, but the theology cannot be proven and, and religion cannot be proven 100% true scientifically just because they're their God isn't in front of us. God isn't doing these miracles in front of us. Um, and we weren't there when they happened. Um, but with that being said, his, history does provide kind of this trustworthiness to back up theological ideas. Um, and like I said, as a, as a scientifically minded person, this helps me a lot in my faith walk. Um, I remember being very young, uh, not very young, just probably junior high, uh, kind of starting to really understand some of the ideas that are happening in the Bible. And some of my first thoughts were, well, I want to, I want proof. I want proof that this actually happened. Um, and there are luckily historic, there's historical evidence to point back to the times of the Israelites that you can see and, and not, well, not see personally, but you can see them uh, online. And I was lucky enough to actually go to Israel um, a couple of months ago and see some of these sites and, and see uh, one of the coolest things that I saw was the well of Jacob where the story of the woman on the well happened. Of course, this is New Testament. This is talking about Jesus, um, but it's still pertaining to scripture and it still is, is something that uh, has really helped me through my faith walk. Um, and like we can take these stories from the Bible and prove historical evidence or, and provide historical evidence to prove the authenticity of the story. Um, this is something that I have used to help people kind of understand the Bible, um, kind of debunk the idea of that the Bible is just a bunch of made up stories, um, from a bunch of random people. Um, th this is a conversation I go to quite often, uh, probably because my mind is scientific and that's something that has helped me a lot. Um, my next question, I discussed the authorship of the historical books. Um, this is something I found really interesting. Um, cause I, I remember in my new Testament class, uh, a lot of talk of the new Testament class was who is the author of this book. And then we can use the author to kind of make, um, assumptions or kind of connect dots to other books, um, because they were written by either the same author. Um, so you can kind of see similarities in them. Um, so I was excited to look into this and I found that each of the historical books authors are anonymous. Um, even biblical references references are no help to provide an idea of authorship. Um, I think this is really interesting because um, my next point, subject matter of the historical books cannot be used to track down the author either. Uh, something that you do that I did a lot in my New Testament class was we were look at the, we were to look at the subject matter of a book or a passage or something. Um, and from that you can you can kind of get a general idea of who wrote that book. Um, we did this blind, of course, in the New Testament, so we read something of Paul, and then you go to another book of Paul, and you can kind of see um, similar ideas. One of Paul's similar ideas that I, that I can never forget is the idea of unity. Um, so Paul writes a lot about unity, and you can see that in a lot of his books. So uh, if I'm reading a book and I kind of pick up this uh, idea of unity, I can probably assume that it was written by Paul. Um, but with the historical books, we are unable to do that. Um, we can't quite lock down uh, who the authors are. Um, for an example, the book of Samuel was named after Samuel because of the critical role in the story of the book of Samuel uh, in David's life and Solomon's life, um, or Saul's life, excuse me. Um, but we can't say that Samuel wrote the book of Samuel. Um, it was a Jewish tradition to name the story or to name the book after uh, one of its critical characters. Um, so to say that Samuel wrote the book of Samuel, uh, we, can't, we can't quite do that because, again, 
that Jewish tradition kind of debunks that. It kind of kind of inhibits us from from saying that. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely thought that was very interesting because we can trace a lot of the authors of of biblical text. And then uh, the last question I wanted to touch on was one of the Bible study questions. I love these ones because they're at the very end um, and they're kind of they're really applicable. I try to make them really applicable. Um, and I thought this one was interesting. To be successful, what must you do Look, looking for Joshua 1? Um, and I found Joshua 1.7. Um, be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave to you. Do not turn from it. Uh, do not turn from it to the left or to the, to the right or to the left, excuse me, that you may be successful wherever you go. Um, God here is instructing Joshua to continue the job Moses started with the Israelite people. Again, like I said, uh, in the beginning of this, we know that Moses was unable to go into the promised land, uh, so he kind of set his people free. Joshua now becomes the um, kind of intern Moses or the new leader, um, and God is speaking with Joshua and saying, hey, do not forget these laws. If you do forget these laws, you will be unsuccessful, but when you follow these laws, you will be successful. Um, he's reminding uh, the people of Israel, but he's also warning the people of Israel um, to not forget these laws and to um, really hold true to these because like Moses did in his in his first speech in Deuteronomy, he, he reminded the people of what had happened when he did forget these laws, but he also reminded them of what uh, happened when they when they follow the laws. Um, so moving forward, moving this to more of an applicable sense to us in the twenty in living in twenty twenty um, as a society, God isn't uh, warning us to really follow the law that was set in place in Deuteronomy or in Exodus or Numbers. Um, He's really reminding us to follow the law that Jesus sent us. And like I said, we are still God's people. God is still talking with us. He's still moving in us. Um, so he, he is, he's always, I think he's always kind of sending subtle reminders like, hey, don't forget this. Like, hey, I set this in place for you a really long time ago. Uh, I sent my son down to kind of change it, to switch it up. And this is something that you guys need to be following. You are still my people. I am still going to remind you just as I reminded my people back in the day, uh, back in the day of the Israelites. Um, and this, again, is another example, is another story of the Old Testament that is speaking to our society today. I mentioned this before, a lot of these Old Testament books can be very easily skimmed over in the church. Um, one, because they can be confusing. Um, I know that I've talked to some of my, uh, some of my leads or kind of mentors about why we don't speak on the Old Testament too much in the church. Um, one of the reasons is that there are a lot of new time guests often, and hearing some of the stuff in the New Testament may be a turnoff. Um, to me, that's a little silly because I think that Scripture is, of course, God breath, so anything from Scripture is good, and anything that we hear from Scripture is good and, and can be beneficial to us. Um, so I think that it's really a shame that we do miss some of this stuff because. All of the stuff in the New Testament that we hear is amazing. It's great. It's Jesus, and Jesus calls us to love. He came and established this new law, but there is no Jesus without the Old Testament. We need to know the roots of the history of Jesus, and we need to know where this stuff comes from and how, as God's people, we should be interacting with God and what we should and shouldn't do. And there's so much of that. Uh, in the Old Testament. And of course, we have the New Testament books that can help us with that as well. But I think the combination of both is really what creates a, a, a solid and firm disciple, um, a disciple rooted uh, in Scripture and um, rooted in God and has this um, beautiful relationship with God. Um, and that's something I am trying to sh and I'm striving to be. Um, this class has really motivated me to be that. Um, because I have seen the effects, and I have seen the great things that the Old Testament has to offer. Um, so that is something that I'm striving to be. This is my reference page. These are some of the references I use. A lot of them just kind of to quote scripture. Um, and then I use our textbook quite a bit. Uh, I have, I'm loving our textbook so far. It's been a great read. Um, it has a lot of really good information. Um, so yeah, that is my uh, week four assignment um, covering uh, chapters 9, 10, and then the Bible study questions. 
Um, thank you for listening, and I hope you have a wonderful day.